up, swashbucklers? You're listening to Under the Crossbones, episode number 106. My name is Phil Johnson. I'm your host for the show. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling your friends. Thanks for saying nice things on Facebook and just being part of the crowd uh, and help me keep the old barge afloat. It's nice of you. So here we are, episode 106. Fun fact about the number 106. Just two weeks ago, they found a 106-year-old fruitcake in Antarctica in what they think is the very first building in Antarctica, and they believe that the fruitcake was taken over there in 1910 during the Terra Nova expedition of Robert Falcon Scott. 1910, 1911, they haven't pinned down the date yet. Uh, But they said it looks edible. Like the tin that it came in was a disaster, but the fruitcake itself looked edible, which I guess is a good argument for refrigerating your snacks. Uh, Antarctica keeps things fresh. That's what they do. Anyway, I'll link the article that I read about that on uh, in the show notes at underthecrossbones.com slash 106 so that you can uh, read all about it. It actually was a pretty interesting read, and uh, and uh, you can check it out for yourself in case you don't believe me. My guest on the show today is Michael Knowles, and Michael is a pirate artist. He does really cool pirate art, and he's also a former senior art director uh, for the Walt Disney Company. So we talk a bunch of Disney World stuff. Uh, we talk a bunch of pirate art, art-specific stuff, and it's a really fun interview. And Michael is a totally great guy who, of course, you can find at michaelknowles.com. And uh, on Facebook, just search Michael Knowles and he'll come up. And so that we're going to get to that interview in just a moment here. Uh, first, uh, Je- Texas is a mess, is it not? Texas, oh my gosh, this Storm Harvey, which is the Wimpiest name for a storm I've ever heard. But uh, a, a tropical storm, Hurricane Harvey, is down there battering Texas, and it's all bad. And I know we've got a lot of friends, uh, especially in that part of Texas, Houston, the Gulf Coast area, uh, just getting pounded right now. So if you would like to uh, donate money or food or help in some way, uh, I have a really good resource uh, for that that lists all the different uh, organizations that are doing stuff down there and uh, and you can donate money or food or help or whatever you, you would like to do, which would be very cool. And uh, so I will link that on the show notes again at underthecrossbones.com slash 106. Uh, and also if you just tap the album cover in your uh, in your podcast catcher there, you should be able to find the link in there too. Um, I, I, Red Cross, generally a safe bet. Uh, some of the other organizations listed do some good things and uh, maybe... Don't put all the money where it's supposed to be. But uh, anyway, so there's a lot of good organizations there. But generally, the Red Cross is a fairly safe bet. Uh, Salvation Army, mm, a little weird and culty. Read about the history of the Salvation Army. It's pretty strange. Very. It's not just Santa Claus is on the corner in December. It's not. It's weird and it's very culty and strange. But anyway, uh, so if you're uh, near Texas uh, or in, if you're you're not listening to this if you're in Houston or the Gulf Coast area right now. You're not listening to this. But if you listen to it after, I'm sorry that storm hit you so bad. And uh, and and there's probably water everywhere. And uh, I hope uh, I hope it gets better soon. That's uh, that's no good. Uh, meanwhile, we've been out here living the West Coast life in California, uh, where it was uh, 90 degrees yesterday and and uh, dry and summery. And we got our big stupid TV that we bought. I mentioned it last week. We got our big stupid TV put up on the wall. Right above our fireplace, we took down a, a very nice, peaceful painting of a river going through an autumn forest that had been over our, our fireplace since we moved in. And we took that down, and now we put up a window to the world so that we can watch it disintegrate before our eyes. There's a big, stupid TV over my fireplace now, and I have to find somewhere else to put my nice, contemplative river going through an autumnal forest painting. Uh, Because I like it. Uh, It actually belonged to my grandmother. And the frame uh, was built by my uncle. So I have to find another place to put that. But it took, the guy came, because I wasn't going to put it on the wall uh, myself. I could have done it, but here's the thing. Had I done it and then it fell down, then I'm in giant trouble. So if I pay a guy 150 bucks to come out and do it, who's got insurance and uh, a guarantee, then if it falls off the wall, totally not my fault. I will pay 150 bucks for it to not be my fault when it falls off the wall. Uh, but anyway, he did a good job. Uh, he came out uh, Sunday night. Uh, I had, wow, yeah, Sunday night, uh, he and his partner came out, and they put the TV on the wall. took him about half an hour, and then it took me uh, three hours to uh, hook everything else up. 
the, the sound system and the program the remote and do all the other. It took me three hours to finally get everything together. So now we have a big, giant, stupid window to the world above our fireplace. And, uh, and I hope she appreciates it. Uh, I watched like one TV show. I watch, yeah. Oh, well, that's what it is, you know? keep the lady happy that's what we do <laughs> so i gotta go out and earn some money uh so i got tour dates coming up because i gotta pay for the big stupid tv this thursday august the 31st i will be at the blue lagoon in santa cruz california tuesday september the 5th i'll be at spats in berkeley california uh wednesday september the 6th i'll be at 88 keys in morgan hill california friday september the 9th i'll be at trek wine in novato california Setting up the video camera for that one. That one is always a good show. And then uh, Saturday, September the 9th, I will be at two shows, Critical Hit and Comedy Oakland. Both of them in Oakland. I will be popping in for short sets at both shows. And uh, so you can see that. Uh, The reason I'm doing a bunch of short sets uh, around town is because the World Series of Comedy is coming up. And that uh, will be uh, Wednesday, September the 13th is my first competition night. That's at the El Cortez in Las Vegas, Nevada. So of those shows, uh, the full-length shows is uh, 88 Keys and Morgan Hill on the 6th, Trek Wine on the 8th, Nevada. I'll be doing full-length shows at those. And the other ones I will be popping in for short sets. So it's all good. You can get all of my tour dates at uh, underthecrossbones.com and then click on the tour dates button. It'll take you to where all the information is. And I got Florida coming up, Orlando's coming up. I got stuff in Wisconsin. I got stuff in Minnesota. Uh, a whole bunch of good stuff. Uh, Vancouver, Canada is coming up. All sorts of good things. So that's where you can get the tour dates. If you're enjoying the show, I hope you'll come over and join us over on Facebook at facebook.com slash under the crossbones. On Twitter, we're at under crossbones. No the in that. And of course, make sure that you're subscribed through uh, iTunes or Podcast Addict or whatever you're, wherever you're catching your pods. Uh, catch this pod there. And that's how you get all the new episodes every Tuesday. Uh, they can actually come in the in the depth of the night because they come out at midnight East Coast time because uh, that's uh, – I may want to make sure everybody's got a Tuesday morning. That's why I do that. If you want to help support the show, that would be awesome of you. Although, you know what? If you're planning on giving me money this week, uh, just go donate it to the, uh, the 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 people in Texas. All right? That would be good of you because that's probably what I'm going to do with it if you send it to me anyway. So forget about money donations to the show this week. Go donate it to Texas. However... If you would like to come over and click my Amazon banner, that doesn't cost anybody any money, and that would uh, that would uh, that would be cool. So if you click, go to underthecrossbones.com slash support. There's a little Amazon banner there. You click that Amazon banner, you go buy yourself something nice, and then uh, Amazon kicks me back a few shekels, and that that helps out uh, to keep the show on the road. If you want to be a sponsor of the show, that is cheap and easy. Go to underthecrossbones.com slash support. Catch me from there, and we will get it going. All right, so why don't we dive in? Michael Knowles is a super interesting dude. We're going to talk about pirates. We're going to talk about art. We're going to talk about Disney. We're going to talk about all sorts of stuff. And uh, and I think it's a really fun interview, and I think you guys are going to dig it, okay? And, of course, you can find him at michaelknowles.com. All right, here we go. Let's do it. This is Michael Knowles. An artist uh, primarily these days known for your uh, fantastic pirate art, which we will definitely discuss. And you have uh, been uh, in the theme park business for years and years and years. So uh, give us a little bit of background about where you started out as an artist. I uh, graduated from Ringling, Ringling as like the circus, Uh uh, School of Art and Design in Sarasota. And I was a fine arts graduate. This was way back in the 70s. And... uh, (laughs) So I, I, I started out, I, I really wanted to teach. Oh, okay. But, and I did for a while, and then I found out what 10th grade art teachers made for a living, <laughs> and I said, no, can't do this. Yeah. <laughs> Got to move on. But, uh, no, I met my wife, at the, my wife Roxanne, at the Largo Renaissance Festival in Largo, Florida. Uh-huh. And wow. I, I, it, it had nothing to do with pirates at the time, but it... It turned me into a pretty good street performer, as far as that went. What were you doing? I was just doing human uh, stunt work, actually. I was doing human chess matches and jousting tournaments. Oh, wow. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I don't fall off horses anymore. I had to give that up. <laughs> I'm too old. What got you into that Renaissance Fair scene? How did you get into that part of it? While I was in art school, this was in like 1977 at Ringling, uh-huh. uh, 
they decided to have a medieval fair. Okay. And it was the first one at the Ringling Museum. And uh, as as art students, we were all uh, we were all really excited about that. We wanted to see what it was. So a whole troop of us of art students became uh, the participants in this human chess match that they were having. <laughs> and to get into it, we had to learn sword work and staff work. And that kind of thing, how to fall without hurting yourself and, and do different things. So we did uh, we did a chess match, and that's how I got started in the thing. It sounds really strange, but that's what that's what started it, and uh, it was a blast. So we started doing them. We started traveling around the country in a troop. We actually started a stunt troop called the Bronze Dragons. Neat. And we went around just doing chess matches at medieval fairs and renaissance festivals. And it was just a blast. We we had fun. You play with the people. That was the most fun was just interacting with all the people. Yeah, that's great. And uh, so then where do you, uh, I know eventually that turns into a pirate festival, if I remember from your bio, right? How does that lead into the pirate festival? Well, it was very indirectly. Mm. <laughs> I Like I said, I, I met my wife at Largo, uh-huh. and uh, she was working at Disney at the time. She was working at the... United Kingdom Pavilion at Epcot as a street comedy performer. Oh, neat. She belonged to a troupe that had many Californians in it called uh, Sack Theater, S-A-K. Okay. And and I met her, and I was on the royal court at, at Largo uh, just performing. And, uh, well, we got together, and she talked me into moving to Orlando, and I came up here, and I worked in the convention industry for a while theme convention industry, and then I went to work for Disney, and I was in a department called Creative Entertainment. Now it's uh, Walt Disney uh, Creative Entertainment Design. I hate titles like that. It's yeah. too long. <laughs> and, and so what year is this when you're entering Disney World, and what's going on at Disney World at that time that you're working on? Oh, at that time, it was in the, it was in the early 80s. We okay. were married in 1982. And uh, Epcot was just finishing up. Uh-huh. In fact, there were two or three pavilions that weren't there in the park. So I went to work uh, for Disney then and went under contract and held the contract for 33 years, working as a show designer and an art director. But I had to learn how to do everything, how to paint scenery and carve and work with fiberglass and basically learn the business. That seems to be a common story among people at that level with Disney where they have they have skills going in and and those skills only partially apply once they actually get there and there's a ton of on the job learning. I don't know if it's still like that with the company but certainly with a lot of the uh old school imagineers and types yeah. that I've spoken with that really seems to be the case. What was uh what was the first project that you went in on that where you just thought, "Oh boy, here I, I got to learn some stuff here." Well, the first job that I ever did, believe it or not, was as a rock work technician. Okay. I carved rock work, and I, they threw me in the fire, Phil. They, <laughs> they did. That was the only way to learn it, really. I mean, throw you in the fire and start dancing. Yeah. So yeah. it was It was one of those things where uh, we were doing the Norway Pavilion at Epcot, and we were doing rock work on the inside for the dark ride or... Uh, for Norway, uh-huh. and I, I supervised that, and I was the field art director on it, and then they, when we started Disney MGM Studios, I moved on over to uh, uh, to WDI, which is WDI now, but at the time it was WED, right. uh, WED, WED Enterprises. You probably know this already if you talk to some... Uh, some of the guys. I'm quite but, the Disney dork, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, we can be friends anyway, I suppose. <laughs> I, I'm kidding. But anyway, I worked on Catastrophe Canyon, and I was the field art director on the Indiana Jones Epic Stunt Theater. Uh-huh. And and just working with the different contractors and the rock builders, and uh, it just went on from there. I... I was able to get into creative entertainment and started doing design work for those guys and ended up doing that for 33 years. That's crazy. 
with the your yeah. your title as art director, that's a, a sort of a nebulous title. How would you describe the 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 job description of art director? What does that entail? You start off by yourself, really. Now that I think of it, you uh-huh. start off by yourself because they brought me in to do concept art. Okay, and we we would draw the concepts to create a drawing package, and as it went along, it would gather steam and uh, the the show people the. Uh, stage managers and, and, and senior directors and that type of thing will get involved. And you show them your first run, and they pull out the red pens, and they put a lot of circles and arrows on the stuff. And you go away for a while, and you go back in about a week later, you refine everything, and it, it turns into a drawing package. And it goes on up the line. They, they show it to uh, ride-and-show engineers and, and people that – are actually going to make it real. Uh-huh. Yeah, like if you if you hang a sun <laughs> in the middle of your drawing or a moon, then you have to explain it to the engineers because they will immediately tell you that it's going to cost ten million dollars to do that. <laughs> you know? So you know, I went through that for a long time, but but I thoroughly I thoroughly enjoyed it and learned a great deal about the business by working with these guys. It, to this day, if, if you want anything done right or built well, you have to go to an engineer. Sure. And I feel so I feel so sorry for the the interns and the younger people. Uh, this is nothing against our millennials. God bless their little dangerous hearts, but uh, <laughs> they uh, they don't go to the extent that we did. We used to spend. You have to take it to the shop. Uh huh. You have to become material wise and material smart for that kind of thing, and uh, I, I hope they do that because they won't regret that. Because these are interesting people to talk to. The old Central Shop at Disney is one of the greatest places you could ever walk through because of the, the creativity. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, that's what I did for a long time. That's fascinating. Yeah, it was a blast. It was a blast. In fact, I worked with a lot of the California guys out there. Uh huh. Did you do any work on the the Florida version of Pirates of the Caribbean in in any of its refurbs or redesigns or any of that? No, that was all done. All those decisions were made by uh, WDI in California. Okay, they're the attractions people. Ah, what I, what we were responsible for in Florida were mostly uh, I don't want to call them dog and pony shows, but <laughs> they were mostly special events, uh, parades, add-ons to the to the existing attraction, uh-huh. and uh, yeah, and working working from strictly the entertainment angle. Oh, okay. We, we would we would put things out there. They were there for a short time, and then they would pull them down. I see. And Disney does that a lot. Yeah, I didn't realize there there was that uh, that uh, hard line of a division between those two elements of the company, though. That's interesting. Yeah, it really does because uh, uh, Walt Disney Imagineering they oversee the permanent plugged into the ground attraction. Okay. And at entertainment, we were just the opposite. Got it. We were kind of a bastard child of the movie business and theater. Uh-huh. So, so you have to combine those two disciplines to do what we do. And uh, it's a great deal of fun. It's, it's very challenging because you're constantly on a budget. And in the case of WDI, they're never on a budget, or they don't seem, well, they don't seem to care. <laughs> now, I worked for a fellow named John Olson, okay, and a gentleman named Bill Dennis, uh-huh. and they were with WDI. They got me my first gig with WDI. Nice, and uh, they were instrumental in communicating. Uh, there was also a, a fellow. He may be retired now. Uh, his name was George Head, H-E-A-D. Uh-huh. And those are the guys from California that I work with. All familiar names. Oh, yeah, all through the career. And, and uh, a lot of great sec decorators and, and different people from entertainment from out there as well. Do you have a favorite project that you worked on? Yes, I do, and they're getting ready to pull it down. I, I worked on the uh, the great movie ride that was at uh, oh. Walt Disney Studios. Now. Yeah. I was one of the field guys on that, and we had so much fun because we, we got a chance to meet all the different actors because they had to come in and buy off on their uh, 
on their animatronic characters. Oh, how neat. <laughs> yeah, that was very cool. I met Clint Eastwood. I'm taller than him. <laughs> I didn't expect that. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you go. I got one over on you, Clint. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, and uh, I met uh, Marino Sullivan, who was the original Jane in the uh, the Johnny Weissmuller Tarzan movie. Neat. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, we met the family of Margaret Hamilton from The Wizard of Oz, and uh-huh. they they had to come in and make sure all the proportions were right. Uh, let's see, uh, Patrick Wayne, John Wayne's son, came in, uh-huh. and uh, it was it was just a tremendous thing because it it harkens back to the old age of movies, and it was it was just a lot of fun. Certainly, yeah. Uh, did you always want to be in an entertainment sort of business, or were you really just focused on the art when you were studying? Well, when I was studying, I mostly on the art. And mm. as a matter of fact, I was immersed in the art. That's, that was, as a fine arts graduate, we would, you know, we would paint in the studio all day and sculpt. We had a printmaking class uh, where we learned engra- engraving. Uh, it was ringling was pretty much old school at that time. I learned etching. Uh, the methods really haven't changed since the Renaissance. Uh-huh. So learning how to pour metal, uh, the bronze, and, and that type of thing. But it did a lot of painting. And uh, now ringling was a good experience as far as basic preparation uh, for for an art career. What made it so? How did they prepare you? Oh, the, just the faculty. Okay. I. The, the way Ringling was set up at that time, you had to be asked back, literally, after each semester. Uh. That's, how they, that's how they culled the herd, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> they'd send you a letter. You were off fishing somewhere in Sarasota, and they'd send you a letter and say, okay, we want you to come back in for the, and finish out the year, and that's the way it went every year. Interesting. So what would start out as a class of about 650 kids uh, you'd end up with about 300 by then, by the wow. end of the year. That's crazy. And was that being was being asked back, was that uh, contingent upon just your skill as an artist, or were they looking at things that you were doing outside the school as well to see if you were advancing it as a career too? No, the, there was no career okay. at that point. <laughs> you were basically, like I said, immersed in your school, sure. in your schooling, and uh, and you were you – were, you were graded. You really weren't given a grade as such uh-huh. at Ringling. You were just given. Uh, they would take progress reports on you. Okay. And uh, you had to be very aware of your intuition and your. They called it ideation. Uh-huh. Isn't that a cool word? Yeah. Yeah, it was like the art of the idea, and you were graded on that kind of thing. But most of the attention was on technique, the way a thing was done, and. Uh, a way to interpret things visually. Okay. A lot of emphasis was put on that. Uh, I was I was very fortunate. I could draw when I got in there, but they taught me how to see and how to uh, use my intuition. Hmm. It's like a, a guitar player. Uh-huh. A professional musician, he doesn't have to think about every time the pick touches the string. Uh-huh. If you had to think of technique, you'd never get done. You would never be able to be creative. Yep. So... It teaches you to draw intuitively and uh, how to work naturally. Right. Without concerning yourself with technique. Yeah. It goes beyond technique. Uh, it's it's interesting that you use that as an example because I'm both a guitar player and a guitar teacher. And um, I have early students that come in and they're so focused on the, the counting and the technique. And then they watch me play and they go, I want to play like you. And I go, well, you got to get all past all that technique stuff first. We got to get that ingrained so that you don't have to think about it anymore. And they always look at me like I'm crazy. So, <laughs> Well, it's the absolute truth. Yep. Because if a, if a guitar player has to think about every time he makes a move on the guitar. You may be playing the notes, but you're not making music. Yeah, my mantra is thinking damages art. Yes, sir. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so let's fast forward a little bit. How do you how do you uh, develop a love for pirates so much so that you want to dedicate a chunk of your art to them? Well, it, it started back when I was a kid. Really, I've always kind of sketched and played around with them. Uh, mm. It became it, it became a part of our life in around 2000. Okay, the year 2000. Uh, my wife and I. We were both working for Disney at the time, and uh, they were having an event in Key West called Fantasy Fest. Perhaps you've heard of it. Yeah. It's, it's Key West's version of the Mardi Gras. Uh-huh. 
Well, there was about 20 of us that worked in entertainment at Disney. And I says, what the hell? Why don't we go uh, down to Key West and we'll go down as a pirate troop? <laughs> and we went down there and we were all slapdash pirate in a bag kind of people. We just, we just went down there to have fun mostly and, uh, and indulge in alcohol and enjoy Key West. And, sure. and we, anyway, we went down there and we actually won best marching band. <laughs> <laughs> How funny. They gave us a plaque, <laughs> you know, with our with our picture of our troop, and all we had was tambourines and washboards and just you know just junk like that. And but uh, that gives you an idea of the other musical talent that was out there. Because, <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but anyway, we we had fun. We won, and it was said we want to do this again. Well, Key West felt the same way because they decided to have an event the next year called Pirates in Paradise. Okay. So we refined our act a little bit, and we went down there with a troupe. We called ourselves the uh, On the Lamb Players. Uh Uh-huh. And we just started interacting with the other pirate participants, and it became a street event. Uh Uh-huh. And, of course, we had the, you know, it was a sponsored event, so there was, it was the first time any of us got paid, and uh, we just, we just had a blast playing pirate. And it got more and more sophisticated. The costumes started to look more and more period. And uh, we we learned pirate music and that type of thing. In fact, me and a couple of my buddies, uh, we started a group called the Rusty Cutlass. Okay. There were six of us at the time. And uh, we started out mandolin, guitar, concertina, and uh, bass. And I played the Bowden or the Bodron, which is the... Uh, it's an Irish war drum. Yeah, nice. I'm sure you've seen them. They play with, play with one hand. Yep, I've seen them. Oh yeah. So anyway, it was it was really fun, and and we started doing that, and we learned more and more pirate songs, nautical songs, uh, uh, just anything seafaring, really. Uh huh. And, and that's more or less how my artwork grew. I I concentrated on the the golden age of piracy, but anything nautical. Any, if you've looked on my web page, you'll see that there's not a lot of swashbuckling and sword work and, you know, that type of thing, but it's more situational. Right. It's, it's things that could be, could be funny under the right circumstances or could be real tragic, depending <laughs> on uh, your mood. That, yeah, and there, I, I was looking. At, I was looking at all your pieces uh, just yesterday to refresh my memory on them, and they are extremely detailed. I mean, just tons and tons and tons of very dense detail in those pictures. Was your art always like that, or is that something that developed? No, I've always I've always used a lot of detail. Uh, I, that's where God lives. I, I believe that, and I, I, as an illustrator, you want to tell a story, uh-huh. and if you can do it in one image. Then you're successful. Yeah. So I, I try to put details in that'll take your eye from one piece of the story to the next. They say your eye enters a picture plane on the bottom left hand side uh-huh. and travels around uh-huh. clockwise and comes back to the first point. Mm. And that's kind of the way compositionally my stuff is set up. Interesting. I'd never heard that before. Yes, yeah, like geometrically, if you if you look at if you look at Da Vinci and Michelangelo, they all worked inside of a, a trapezoid or a triangle. If you were to draw a line around, uh, say, Michelangelo's Pieta, uh-huh. okay, it's it's a perfect triangle. It's really interesting. It, uh-huh. But there's a there's a form of it's called the golden mean M E A N rectangle. Uh-huh. Right. And artists have used it forever to. Uh, to set up composition. Sure. And it works. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I use that only because, and I guess that's why I'm guilty of putting in too much detail. Uh, <laughs> I noodle. I noodle sometimes. We call that noodling. It's, uh-huh. it's, it's when you just, you concentrate on one area of the drawing and the drawing gets away from you. It takes, <laughs> it takes possession of you at that point. Uh-huh. And you say to yourself, well, why did you noodle that so much? Now you got to noodle the whole thing. <laughs> So you go along, and the story takes possession of you, and that's that that slows you down a bit, so that you're aware of your own story. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Don Mates, are you familiar with Don Mates' work? 
He's fantastic. I think he was uh, episode four or five of this show, actually. I talked to him real early on. He's great. Yeah, Don's a classmate of mine. Oh, okay. We've known each other a long time. He's a good man. He's the best fantasy painter I ever met, uh-huh. bar none. Yeah. But anyway, with the drawings, working in black and white is is a beautiful form, in my opinion, of storytelling. Certainly, yeah. Because of the clarity. Yeah, and and uh, I noticed you had done some, you've done a few, and you did some recently, I think I saw on your Facebook page, in color. What prompted you to actually put some color on? Oh, people were bugging me to do it. <laughs> Just that. Okay. That makes sense. I love the black and white stuff, too. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my business manager came to me, and he says, well, listen, why don't you color some of this stuff? (laughs) I'm going, oh, well. So I went, and I I colored them, and the first festival we did with those things, Phil, a a lady came up and bought them right off the bat. We had been there for about 15 minutes. Funny. So it added it added a great deal of life to what I thought was a pretty lively drawing. Uh huh. It's there's so much in the drawing that it almost seems like the color would uh, not not take away from it, but distract from some of the details that are going on in those drawings. I mean, for me, like I I've always loved animation art and things like that, but I like the uh, the, the rough sketches more so than the colorized parts of it because the simplicity of the line yeah. creating a motion and a story I've always just thought is astounding. And I see a lot of that in your work too, that the color it adds to it, but at the same time, it also is a weird detail that didn't maybe didn't need to be paid attention to. It really does. Uh, I never thought of it that way, but it, it gives the, it gives the drawing kind of an unfinished quality. Yeah. <laughs> because people, people like, uh, they like all the fancy color and, and that type of thing. but uh-huh. And uh, I enjoy painting, don't get me wrong, but drawing is, my storytelling lends itself, it, it's better with drawing. Yeah. It's more self-explanatory. It doesn't look like you just, I'm not a fast painter. Uh-huh. But I, I, I love color, but uh, no, I just prefer the black and white stuff. That makes sense. I, I, I really enjoy that kind of thing, too. And um, the the scenes that you draw, like you said earlier, they're not swashbuckling. They're these tiny, uh, tiny just bits of moments of time in the, the life of these pirates that really has nothing, not much to do with being a pirate, essentially. Where is that? Has that always been sort of a theme in your art uh, along the way? Or is that something that is more what you do with the pirates? Well, it is. It, OK, all of the above, really. OK. Uh, it's just- <laughs> I enjoy I enjoy showing good sword work and that kind of thing naturally, and I love to take I, I love to isolate famous people from piracy like you know Blackbeard, Captain Kidd, and whatnot. Uh-huh. But I like the everyday life of uh, mariners. Okay. Whether you're deep water sailors or uh, rivermen, but if, if you look at a few of the things like uh, there's one there's one. Uh, of the the high seas collection of the ship's cook, yeah, it's called the bilge party, uh huh, and it's it shows the chi- the ship's cook, he's in his little hammock down in the hold, and uh, he's surrounded by all of his friends, the uh, his parrot and his cat, <laughs> and he spilled some rum, and all of them are drunk, all of them are passed out, the parrot's passed out, the cat. So on and so on, and the and the rats even from the bilge they're passed out. So it was it was just a, an interesting story because a pirate ship they were the first democracy. Uh-huh. Believe it or not, because uh, you weren't fired if you were if you were to lose a leg or a limb or an eye or or something like that in in in, in combat. No, they didn't fire you or throw you overboard or anything silly like that. They just gave you another job. Right. <laughs> So if you're a sailmaker now, or a cook, or uh, you splice rope, I guess the whole idea of it, Phil, is if somebody has to drive the ship. Sure. Okay. They didn't lay around drinking rum and chasing women all night. Right. That's a fabulous idea of a way of life, but it's not realistic. (laughs) Right. So I tried to take a realistic thing and just put a humorous spin on it. Yeah, and uh, I I like the humor of the pieces a lot, and the uh, I like that there's a there's a whole story going on there. And I'm maybe making this comparison just because you worked for Disney for so long, but they're they they remind me a little bit of Mark Davis's work, who obviously did a whole bunch of the concept art for Pirates of the Caribbean uh, when it. Oh or, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. I love Mark's work. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it reminds me a little bit of his stuff. Quite a bit. 
now that you mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, well, I've, I've got a couple of good research books on the making of. Oh, okay. We, we, we call them style books uh-huh. in the industry because if you need a reference for a certain thing, you look up different images and so on. And, uh, yeah, he was instrumental in the, in, de- in the developmental stages of the ride. Sure. But, boy, did they put model makers to work and, yeah. <laughs> and scenic painters. It was unbelievable the work that went into that ride. Yes. They're still building it right now. I mean, it's, it's, see, it's in a state of rehab right now because of, the, uh, because of the films. Yep. Right now, I'd say there are probably four Johnny Depp characters that appear and disappear in different parts of the ride right now. Uh-huh. Barbosa as well, and uh, oh, I don't know how far they're going to take it. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I know they're changing out the auction scene now. That's the that's the big yeah, new change. Are. Yeah, a lot of changes. It hampers the ride because a lot of people go to Adventureland just for that. Sure. And a lot of times they get turned away because it's in a state of rehab. But I, it's all worth it in the end, and it, it stays appropriate. It stays appropriate, and I think the changes are good for, I mean, first of all, Walt always liked to change things up and do new things and whatever, and I think sure. some of the traditionalists get a little too bent on keeping things the same, but also it keeps the rides fresh. I've been on the Pirates of the Caribbean here in California probably hundreds of times, and it's interesting to see something new that wasn't there before, you know, it, rather than just kind of floating in it and having the whole ride memorized. I think that's great. Yeah, and uh, I like the part where you, well, then if you know the ride, you'll know exactly what I'm saying. It's when you you go down and all of a sudden there's cannon fire and uh, the water's coming up all around you from the impact of the cannonballs. And yep. right there was the Jolly Roger. Yep. That's all changed over to the, in Florida, that's all the Black Pearl now. Right. Yeah, we got that too. Yeah. And instead of the, the famous captain, now Barbados, uh, B- Barbados. <laughs> Barbosa is, is standing up there. Yep, and and it's still my favorite scene in the ride. That was always my favorite scene because the cannonball fire and the splashing terrified me as a child. Well, it's meant to do that. Yep, yep, definitely. Supposed to have a little darkness, and then then comes the comedy when you come into the uh, the the village, the town. Yeah, a lot of great, a lot of guys built their characters on what they saw in there. And as a matter of fact, there's a lady in New Orleans who uh, calls herself the Scarlet Harlot. Okay. And she bases her character on the big redhead. Yep. That's in the ride. Yeah, yeah. Who's now a pirate? <laughs> yeah. And Johnny Depp comes out of the barrel instead of the, the poor mayor of the town who they're yep. they're trying to drown and whatnot. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in there. So where is a where's a good place online or in real life for people to keep up with your art and what you're doing and pick up some of your, your work? Oh, just my webpage. Okay. And that webpage is, yeah. uh, remind me, I forgot to write it down. Remind me what your website is. com. Oh, easy enough. I think we should know that. com. Yeah. Cool. And uh, so you're getting around Florida doing all the festivals and selling your work out there and all that? Yeah, we we're, we do about six or eight festivals in Florida. We've got a pretty active pirate life here in Florida. Oh, yeah. And up the East Coast, I think every state between here and Maine has a pirate festival or a seafood festival or something that involves pirates. <laughs> and it's, it's catching on, and it's a lot of fun. The people that are, are pretty active, you would think they were reenactors, uh-huh. but they take on a persona. Yeah. And uh, let's see, if you do you know a lady named uh, Christine Lampy? I do not, no. Okay, she puts out a publication every month called No Quarter Given. Oh, okay, I know what you're talking about, yeah. All right, well, her and her husband, Mike, are good friends of ours, and uh, they're from. She's a, a teacher in real life, and uh-huh. she's she's in California. But uh, yeah, we do. A, there's about fifteen up and down the coast, and they have tall ship festivals where they bring in the schooners and the clipper ships and all the big sailing vessels. A good example would be uh, Gasparilla, sure, in, in, in Tampa. Yeah, that's a big one. There really was never a Gasparilla. There was Jose Gaspar, who was yeah. a, a turtle fisherman. <laughs> it's, but that sounds I'm way serious. less exciting. I know, yeah. <laughs> and like John, like the John Levique Festival in Treasure Island uh, over on, over in St. Pete. Uh-huh. I, it, it's pretty much the same way. Some of these guys were just merchants who uh, got desperate at one time and called right. themselves pirates and got killed off really early in life. And but anyway, there's a festival there, and it's, it's based on pure fantasy. Uh, sure. Some of this stuff didn't happen. You can thank 
people like Robert Newton and Treasure Island for that. Yep, it's all about the storytelling. The next person that says the art of me, I'm probably going to kill him with my bare hands. <laughs> That is one of the things I'm proudest on the on this show is that we have so far pretty much avoided our jokes almost entirely. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, but they're out there. Oh, they are out there. Oh, I could tell them for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do it as part of our musical set. Sure. When we're doing the music, it's all hey, what? What's the pirates' favorite socks? Argyle. Argyle. <laughs> <laughs> There you go, listeners. The first real R joke on this show. It only took 107 episodes to get there. <laughs> okay, well, let that be the last. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, Michael, this has been super fun, man. I will get your uh, website. It has. Yeah, I will get your website linked up in the show notes so everybody can come and see your art and see where you're with shows and festivals you're going to be at and everything. Is there anything I did not ask you about that you want everybody to know? No, it's just su- support your local pirate. There you go. I like it. And go to a festival and play. Yes. Because that's what the reenactors are going to be there for. That's bring right. your kids, bring bring grandma, it, and that's the sweet part about it, Phil. It's a family deal. Yep. And everybody, everybody that dresses up has more fun than they thought possible. <laughs> and uh, it, I, it, it really, it's not. You got the Civil War guys. Okay, they're fun to watch, but uh, talking to them is like watching paint dry because <laughs> there's no personality. Right. <laughs> And the, the pirates are going to bring something to the table because they're going to want to play. Yep. And if you make eye contact with them, look out. Because they will move in, they'll move in on you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Michael. This was really fun, man. You're welcome, Phil. And I hope we get a chance to talk again sometime, man. It's been a pleasure. All right. I'll talk to you again soon. Thanks. All right. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And there it is, friends. That is my interview with Michael Knowles, who, of course, you can find at michaelknowles.com or go to Facebook and search Michael Knowles, and he will pop right up. And, of course, you can catch all the show notes for this episode at underthecrossbones.com slash 106. I'll try to post a couple of uh, Michael's uh, pictures there as well so that you can see that. And, of course, the uh, the fruitcake and the uh, the Texas donation stuff will also be at underthecrossbones.com slash 106. So we're not done yet. I uh, I got uh, Napalm Records sent me an email, and they sent me the new albums from Ye Banished Privateers and Ailstorm, uh, hoping that I would play something on the show. And of course I'm going to play something on the show. Those are two great bands. So we're going to hear some, uh, some a new track from Ye Banished Privateers uh, today. We're going to hear just in a second here. So that's coming up, and it'll, I'll, play, I'll spin some Ailstorm uh, next week or the week after or something like that. and be It'll be fun. It'll be good. We're sponsored today by Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast, WKKC-DB, playing the best music in pirate radio talk. You can listen to Under the Crossbones on both those stations. Just go to PirateRadioTheTreasureCoast.com or PirateRadioTC.com. And don't forget to download their apps. That's the Pirate Radio Treasure Coast app, for that's their music station, and then Pirate Radio Talk, which is the talk station. And if you're listening right now on Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast, thank you. Welcome, welcome to the crew. Welcome to the the family, if you will. I got a uh, ebook for you. It's Alexander Squemlin's Pirates of Panama or Buccaneers of America, originally published in 1678. So it's right, just boom, right there. Golden age, piratey, all sorts of stuff in there, and it's a good read. And it's about it's uh, by a doctor, Alexander Squemlin, who is a doctor who ended up on a bunch of pirate ships and wrote about it. And it's very uh, entertaining, educational, and uh, and it's important pirate literature if you have not read it before. I guess literature technically is uh, fiction, right? It's not fiction. This is uh, this is factual, nonfiction, and uh, so I guess it's not literature. But it is good writing, and you should check it out if you dig pirates. Which if you're listening to this show, is duh. So you can get that for free. Go to underthecrossbones.com, click on the free ebook button, and you can collect yourself right there. And uh, Or if you're out and about and all you got is your phone, just text the word pirate and your email address to 94253. Text the word pirate and your email address to 94253. It'll kick you back the little link to download it right to your phone there where you can read it. And uh, yeah, let's do it. Why don't? How about we get, uh, we get uh, some you banished privateers going here? This is a song from their new album called First Night Back in Port, which I've been rocking in my car, and it is a fun, uh, awesome, uh, good piratey record. So we're going to hear a song called Cooper's Run from the new album, First Night Back in Port. This is Ye Banished Privateers. Enjoy.
that's our show for today. Thank you once again for tuning in and all that good stuff. I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you're telling your friends. If you want to get all the show notes uh, for this episode, go to underthecrossbones.com slash 106. If you'd like to see more Michael Knowles art, and I know you do, man, it's really cool stuff, go to michaelknowles.com. Michael spelled regular, Knowles, N-O-L-E-S. You can also find him on Facebook, of course. If you want to hear more from Ye Banished Privateers, man, this new album is kicking bootay. Kicking just right. It's good, man. Go to yebanishedprivateers.com, and you can uh, pick up your own copy there. And, of course, you can find them on Facebook at uh, Ye Banished Privateers as well. we got some great shows, great guests coming up. Next week, we're going to hear from Captain Dan of the Scurvy Crew. I know you've been waiting for him. Uh, we're going to get uh, Carl Fismer, uh, who is a treasure hunter. We're going to hear from Steve Beam from uh, Pirates for Sale. Lots of good stuff coming up, so stay tuned and uh, keep helping me spread the word for the show so we can get bigger, 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 bigger. All right, I'll see you next week. <laughs>